Okay, so let me show you. I don't have the assignment solution, but I'll go to uh, to this one and I'll go here. Actually, let me go to CMake. Let me go to the source code. So in this example, like I specifically put the ranges that each branch should handle. I mean, will this work if I remove uh, an year less than equal to 2014? Well, yeah, I mean, it'll work. I mean, but if I put like 3000, it'll still tell me that I'm a centennial. And uh, even if I'm the one writing the code in main, and I validate, well, I know I'm just supposed to accept data up to 2014 and I validate that, then uh, my function without the uh, and year less than equal to 2014 is just not correct, right? Like if I forget or if someone in the future forgets to validate the data and then they call my function without validating data, then my function will eventually generate logic errors at runtime, right? So uh, mostly everyone had like greater than 90, greater than 80, greater than 70. And I can show you that that code will break. Uh, doesn't break because you're validating in main, but to avoid the dependency on another person, then your function should work uh, as expected in the function code. So let me show you the test cases here. So if you go to your homework, oops, not this one, this one. I was thinking of the homework assignment. And type like 105 or 10,000 or negative 1,000 your functions will return either A or F. And, uh, and so those are logic errors, right? So usually like at least one or two students at the code required to to make that work uh, and make the function uh, correct, not depending on outside validation, but no one in this class did that. I think that's the first time in a couple of years that that's happened. So any questions on what I'm trying to explain here? Mine's not a question more than just, I guess, a statement. Um, I, I guess I've had previous courses uh, with a similar um, programming prompt. And uh, before, I've been told that to include uh, those like the night, like less than 90, or excuse me, uh, yeah, no, less than 100, you know, just having having it be uh, what you're talking about with the with that end cap uh that it uses more processing power now albeit i think i see what you're saying because the function itself is not validating whereas when we wrote that program in my other cath uh, class i think all of it was pretty much either sequential or all within the same class so um yeah i guess i don't know i'm just explaining uh, yeah <laughs> i'm also confused about that because if you if you use like a less than greater than thing it's if somehow you get decimal data that's not going to register in within certain ranges correctly well in this case we're working with integers so we're not worried about decimals right so but if you said that people can pass bad data in anyway if they pass in a decimal it'll it'll eliminate the decimal portion of the number Convert it to an integer. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So as far as like the processing power, I mean, I guarantee you it'll be less than one or two milliseconds. So in this case, we're more concerned about quality than like a computer that process has a processing power. Uh, that I mean, that statement. I don't even think it'll take one millisecond extra once we put the branching for the end. And 
in the long run, we're more interested in quality than in losing one millisecond, right? Because like that might be the I mean, losing saving one millisecond may, may cost us with logic errors in the future, right? And then like the programmers who wrote the code might be gone and it might be a maintainer. And then that's when that a hundred times more to fix the issue occurs, right? Because we let situations like this go, right? So nobody got points off, like, you know, because I, I didn't ask for that, you know, but it's always uh, good when like uh, developers take it a step further. And if you start working in the industry, like they won't tell you how to code. I mean, unless you work like a very strict uh, shop, but usually stuff like this in the code review with a senior developer will be kicked back and they'll tell you like, uh, yeah, this, you're gonna have to modify this because, you know, the test will fail if we add uh, if we add uh, edge cases, which are like negative 10 or 1000 or something like that. And then if you tell them, well, I mean, the input's gonna be validated. Well, yeah, but we cannot depend on somebody remembering to validate, right? So it's always better for us to Take care of it. Also on the if uh, on the switch, so the same thing, right? On the switch, like mostly everyone, I think mostly everyone did uh, A B C D F, right? So like purposely, I mean, I didn't ask for it, but I, I was. It's always good when students like take examples and apply them to the homework. And nobody, nobody used default. I think one student used default. But he didn't return anything. He did A, B, C, D, uh, A, B, C, D, F, and default, he actually added it, but he didn't return something like to indicate that the number coming in was invalid. So that was the closest uh, anyone got on the switch to returning like invalid option. I, I, I used default and returned an invalid option. It was this? It was Xavier. Okay, uh, if you did, I don't remember, but if you did, that's good, right? So, because remember, the recommended programming uh, best practices on the switch is always, always like, even if you know or you're like 100% sure that you don't need a default, then you all, I mean, you have to provide a default, right? Just in case. Yeah, so I think, yeah, one, so Xavier, I overlooked that one, but there was another student that used default. It just didn't return anything. And for the options, he used ABCD. Very, like, what may seem inconsequential things, right? But, like, if if we're going to be developing code and we're going to focus on correctness and quality, then it's always better to follow the best practices. Okay. Yeah, so that was that. But I mean, nobody got points off. I mean, I usually don't take points off, but in the exam, I will ask, like, make sure you cover all cases, then, then you know how to tackle it, right? Close down the range, and if it's a switch, then make sure you include a default. Okay. I have a question. Um, mm -hmm. So with the input validation that you're talking about, um, I've normally seen it like using like a while loop or something or just have the program continue running until you give it an input that's valid. Are you saying that, you know, there are some cases where we might just want to display an error telling people that their input wasn't valid and have it stop? That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is the function needs to check for correctness. And we didn't create a loop in this program because we've not introduced looping, right? So that's why it was just kind of like, just to exercise uh, conditional statements, I put that requirement in. But usually if somebody inputs bad data, if it's like web data, then yeah, like they won't let them. Like they'll tell them there, like the numbers out of range, right? Okay. Like if you if you're like entering your birth date and you put like eighteen fifty, they I mean 
more than likely they'll be like, oh, that's out of range, right? Or they might not even let you enter that number. But but some websites do let you enter that. But then they'll return like, yeah, are you sure you're alive? You know. <laughs> so. Okay, so where are we? So I think we talked about the while. Uh, we talked about the string, which will come into play um, in the for range in a little bit. So that's why it's important to understand how a string is loaded into memory. Uh, we did a for loop, right? I'm pretty sure we did that. Let me check. Yeah, we, we very simple examples, right? And the while loop is a condition control loop. The for loop is a count control loop. And then the do while loop is also a condition control loop, but it'll always execute at least one time. The while loop may or may not execute more than zero times. If the initial condition fails, it won't execute. Uh, the do while loop always, always will execute one time. I've seen it a lot used in menu menu programs, right? So they display a menu and then they prompt the user to enter a menu selection and then they uh, they uh, display maybe another menu or do some action and then come back to the menu. So that's very popular in, in the early days of uh, C++ and C, the C language. So let's see what we have here. Yeah, so this one is just to demonstrate the, the how it works, right? So we go here. So this is the structure for a do while loop, right? So so we have a do like the while loop. We need a condition, a Boolean expression in here that will eventually, eventually evaluate to false here. So the loop will stop, right? So notice here we have the open close curly brace. Those are required. And then we have a while, a Boolean expression, and then notice right here, semicolon. Usually in the for loop, in the while loop, uh, switch statement, like there is no semicolon required. This is one of the few structures in C++ where we have to include a semicolon. If you forget the semicolon, your program will not compile. You'll get a, a compilation error. And uh, then C++ uh, logging lo will kind of point you to like one or two lines from within, from where the error is, and then you have to go and, and search it. But if you remember how it's structured, then you shouldn't run into that issue, right? So do not forget the semicolon here. Okay, so what do we have here? Write a void function prototype name prompt user with no parameters. Okay. Prompt user. I think this was just to demonstrate a simple do while. Let me go ahead and uh, we need to display something and uh, capture keyboard data, so we'll need the IO stream. And I think I need some more than one, so I'll use C out, C in. So we have uh, do, while some condition, let's not forget the semicolon. So we can say auto, uh, I'll just put like uh, continue. I do this with auto, I have to provide a value, right? So I want to use a character, so I create a uh, character of letter N. So in here I can say, uh, I'll just say continue. And then we 
say cn and we say uh, if continue equals we won't worry about upper lowercase okay for now so the first question is uh, will this program run It's not good if the user enters Y. Yeah. Well, the way it's structured right now, it will not run. Uh, let me see. Uh, or will it run? Let me compile. I think it will run once. And... Uh, Running terminal. Uh, what happened here? Is this the right one? Do while exit. Yeah. Actually. How will it run if I'm not calling it in main, right? So, and then we go to into, uh, do while header, and then I can simply call the function. It was uh, prompt user, right? Prompt user. Uh, enter. And then no. Okay. Yeah, so it runs. So one thing we want to make sure we do is we always want to make sure that uh, we, we're careful with scope, right? So if I try to do this, then it won't run. Right, so if we declare the variable in here, then, sorry, I was thinking of something else, sorry, initially. But if we uh, put it here, then the scope is from here up to here, meaning this variable, C, O, and T, is only visible uh, from line 12 all the way to uh, line 15, right before that curly brace. So if we want to use it as part of the condition, we have to declare it before the code block for the do file, and only at that time will it let us compile, right? So, so I, I guess we can say that this is a user control loop, right? Like we prompt the user, do you want to continue? Yes. Once they enter anything other than yes, our program should exit. And that's what we get here, like our program exits. Nothing to write home about. Questions here? No. Yeah, the same the same concept for the scope applies to the while and to the for loop, right? If we declare variables inside the code block for the while or for loop in here in their code block, they are not accessible after that code block. They're only accessible within that code block. So uh, remember that because that sometimes like if you forget that that'll like cause you to lose a lot of time. Okay, so we go back to do while and then, okay, let me see, write function prototype run menu with no parameters. Okay, so let me see here. Also, uh, I don't think, I don't think any student created a function for the menu. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I, no one did, right? So, or did someone? I didn't. I didn't ask, and you didn't get points off. Like if you didn't do that, 
but I mean, the, the menu would be a good candidate for creating a function, right? And then just calling that function and call it from main. So, okay, so. So if you're, from that, if you're gathering that main should be as small as possible, yes, main should be as small as possible. As long as you don't use, as long as you use what we're uh, covering in class, it should be fine. Like we we covered functions, right? So you can, like for this past assignment, you've covered functions, so you can add a function. Like we've not covered loops, so that's why I specifically put there, like don't use loop because in the past students, you know, add looping and everything. I'm like, hey, wait a minute, like, we're not there yet, right? So. Some students are uh, excited about adding new stuff, right? So what I'm talking about here is mostly like uh, like good programming practices, right? Like a loop is a good candidate for a function. I mean, a loop, a, a menu is a good uh, candidate for, for a uh, function. Let me see, uh, run menu. Okay, so. Are we, what do we do here? What, are we, what am I trying to do here? Okay. By the way, prompt user and run menu, they're not related, right? Run menu, um, prompt user was just to show you the structure of the do while loop, how it works, and run menu is completely different. So let me think here. Okay, so what we'll do here is uh, we'll say uh, display menu, and then uh, we'll. I know I didn't call for that in the instructions, but I think it'll be better if we do this, and then we can say uh, see out. Uh, I don't know. I'll just say option one, whatever, it doesn't really matter, right? Option one. And then we'll just say uh, three uh, exit. Very simple. Okay, so now. Uh, in here, we can say, uh, let me see, uh, uh, okay, let me not forget that semicolon. So then we will. Number really at this point doesn't matter. So let's see. Uh, display menu. Okay, display menu, and then we run the menu. Okay, so let's see. Enter number or something like that, right? in we select an option okay and then what do we do so let's take care of the boolean expression so we pop uh, actually we need another one right uh, this one can probably go in here and auto right this is the user control piece we'll say uh, no here so enter a number uh, and we'll say uh, Continue. Let me see. Should we do that? Actually, no. Right. I guess this was okay over here. We don't have to ask the user. The user will tell us. 
Well, option not equal three, right? We can get away with that here. Okay, but then what do we do here? So we display the menu. Uh, we enter. We prompt them for input. They give us the input, and then what do we do? We create a switch here. Anyone? I was initially thinking it would be an if statement to see if they told them know that they uh, entered the wrong thing if they entered invalid data. Okay, so we so we validate data. Okay, we can do that. So let me uh, put that there. And let me see here. Um, Could you use default for that though? Yeah, okay, we'll eventually add the, valid the validation, but uh, let's come back over here. So can I add a switch there? Can, yes. And he, yeah, I was thinking the same thing that Andrew was saying, like default could be the validation. Okay, I can, I can add a, a switch here. But do I want to do that, or um, do I want to create a different function for it, right? Because we want to create modules for it, right? So a little menu option, something like that. Uh, we accept the number uh, int uh, option. So now here, I can just say, and then I can pass it, right? So now, like, so what's happening here, and uh, when we get to deep dive of uh, functions on Thursday, we're uh, breaking down, we break down the menu into into pieces, right? So run menu, like we shouldn't give it a lot of responsibility. Like, uh, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, display the menu, but then it's a list, it's help from display menu and hand, handle menu option. It's this piece is given to another function, right? Like handle menu option. So, okay, no, not a problem. Yeah. Which reminds me, I'll post the videos tonight. I just I haven't had a chance to upload them. So everyone following me here, right? So we want functions to be small, right? Like once you start like going over like 15, 20 lines of code in a function, then then that's probably a good candidate for uh, being broken down into multiple functions, right? So, so we have the run menu, it'll call display menu. Uh, it'll go ahead and take care of the input right since we're running the menu and then like we'll handle menu option here and then here we can we can use the switch statement All right and we're not going to create other stuff, right? Uh, we'll just say selected. Okay, we're not gonna create another, but in a real program, like say this was like uh, the maybe the accounts receivable, then there'll be a call to a to a, an accounts receivable menu function that'll that'll display like receivable options, and then if this was like payables, then there'll be a call to another function, right? So. And instead, we'll just say like selected option two. And remember, like we have to remember to use break, otherwise we can uh, run into problems, right? So let me see here. Uh, 
maybe we can say say program or exit by or something like that. If three uh, so the purpose of here. the run menu function would be to always show the menu so long as the um, the user entered something correctly, right? Okay, see again here? So the run menu, we're having it always display so long as they, I guess I'm confused because why the while option wouldn't consider one and two. Maybe, maybe that's what you're handling right now. Never mind. So, so as long as we do not select one or two, the loop will continue displaying the menu. Once we select three, right? Uh, let me see here. Well, option not equal to. Uh, let me see. But I think I think you're handling it because because then you if they selected one or two, yeah, it's going so to go to. Yeah. So once they select three, should exit. Then, okay. But we'll. Gotcha. We'll find out in less than a minute, right? So. It won't be the first infinite loop I create. So uh, select it, uh, exit, and then maybe here uh, we can just display invalid option or something. Right. So and I'll go ahead and add new line. Right, so if uh, if we had functions to call, then we could just call them here, and our program will be able to call those functions. Okay, so let me see here. Uh, display menu, enter a number. For now, let's not worry about validation, right? So uh, enter a number, handle menu option. And then uh, while option not equal three, so if it's equal three, and let's see, I think that should work. Go to main. All right, so uh, when usually in, in C programs like C++ programs that are uh, command line based, the, like sometimes you only see like a few lines of code here, like maybe three to four or five, right? Sometimes you see more like in the tic-tac-toe program that you all will create, we'll have a we'll have more lines, but when we get there, you'll understand why. So let me see here. For an terminal, let's see what I did here. Okay, so option one, selected option one, option two, uh, selected option two, uh, option three, uh, in, oh, I didn't put a break, right? So let me see here, that's probably the reason, right? So here, I didn't put a break, that's why we get this double output here, like selected exit and invalid option. However, three is a valid option, right? So. So questions here? No questions. No questions. Okay, so where, I mean, could we have done everything in main? Yes. Could we have done everything in run menu? Yes. Uh, which one would you rather maintain, right? Like, would you rather maintain like where everything's in main, like, and there's issues, or would you rather maintain a program that has functions, a program's broken down into small functions, right? So my experience has been that I, I always like want to maintain programs with that are broken down into functions or into classes because those are easier to maintain, like a lot easier. Okay, so that was the do while. I mean, it's sort of, I've seen it used a lot in menus, so that's why I just.
created this mini program and uh, maybe you want to add menus to your programs in the future then yeah you can get this code just remember here like you would call your functions and those functions would be here or if you yeah so yeah it'll probably be the best case if you want to otherwise you can create your own menu not a big deal so. okay Let me see here, uh, for, for range, right? So in Python, we can uh, iterate a sequence or a string very easily, right? I think you just, like for some character in, in some sequence, then do something with it. Before modern C++, some programmers, some uh, C++ programmers created their own like classes to do that or their own uh, code to do that but as of uh, 2010 modern C++ and C++ wanted, wanted it wanted to make it easier on newbies right they wanted to attract new programmers like young programmers so they uh, started to uh, implement functionality that existed oh, I am in, sorry I thought this was a CPP and the for range this is one right so uh, write a function prototype for loop string with index that accepts a string parameter right so I'm not sure if I did I iterate a uh, did I write a function for that already over here yeah so we're not we're not gonna do it again right this display so it's basically asking the same thing like get a string loop through the string I've already demonstrated something like that. I won't do it again. Instead, we'll focus on using a loop string with for range, right? So we'll say uh, void function loop string with for range accepts a string parameter. Okay, and Oops, not you. Uh, let me move this up here. Okay, uh, so we're not going to do this piece. We've already done it in a previous example, but we'll use a uh, a four range, right? So let me show you the code. I mean, it's not a big difference in the code, but uh, this is the code uh, with the traditional for loop, right? We have to set up the counter. We have to have a condition. We have to increment the counter, and then we can come in here and get the index. Uh, the current index display that current character and a new and, and add a new line so i mean not not it's not difficult to do this right not at all but the pythons and the javas and the c sharps had made it very easy for developers that c++ had to come up with something right so uh we'll say uh for auto c h for character Uh, see out uh, right so so this is the code for a four range loop right so remember auto we leave uh, the data type uh, definite definition up to or assign, definition up to the compiler so the compiler will look at uh, auto and then it'll look at what we're trying to iterate and then it'll say oh, okay that's a string I need to loop through each one so each uh, sequence is composed of characters so then this data type is a character so then on the first iteration if I have hello the value of ch will be ch and I'll, I'll display it and the second one e and the third l 
and so forth and so forth. And this is a four range loop. So any questions here on the syntax? No, I'm here. Yeah. Well, it might it might not be a big deal right now. Like once we get into more complex um, data structures, like list C plus plus list, this really comes in handy. Like when we get into into the vector, the C plus plus vector, then you'll see that this is the easiest way to iterate a vector. So let me go here. And again, uh, there's no test cases here, right? We're just creating. Uh, void functions so using c out okay so now let's go in here and uh, let's call it i thought i had gotten rid of that uh, so we should that and we're like uh, can't believe I forgot the name of that thing loop okay loop string with four range uh, we'll say uh, string uh, value equals hello we'll pass in the value And then we'll go ahead and call it. So nothing, right? H E L L O. So I mean, we get the hello, and we just display one character at a time. Okay. Any questions here? Pretty much self-explanatory. Yeah. I know. In in Java, it says that you can't. You can't use this to modify any values. Is this the same for this? You can only display each character, not change the character. Here you can do both. Fancy. Yeah, but uh, we're not there yet. We'll be there Thursday. Uh, the, there's a concept. Uh, well, let me see here. Do you use replace? Well, uh, what Lisa was talking about is can we can we say like uh, ch equals like some other character here like t? I think that's what she was. I think that's what she was asking. Yes. Yes. That's yeah. So let me, oops, let me look at uh, one note. Okay, where are we? Uh, uh, yeah. Okay, but before I talk about that, let me add this. Okay, so actually, Lisa's question uh, leads us into the next topic, which is why, well, I guess the question is why, why can't you change the values in Java? Okay. Um, I did Java programming, but I've not done it in a while. So I don't, like in four years. I mean, I just help programmers, but I don't do a lot of programming at work. It's mainly timelines and schedules. Uh, but in in uh, C++, you can and you can't, right? depending on how you try to change the value. But before I try, I go in here and write code, what I, I will do is I will diagram this loop in uh, memory. So we have uh, this code. And we won't worry about uh, the memory allocated to a function. We're just going to zoom in on what's happening for to the, the for range uh, data okay and then you take this and hopefully 
when I talk about the other piece on Thursday, then it kind of starts making sense. Okay, so uh, what I'll do here, just to make it easy, is so I'll just say, assuming that we had a string str equals hello, right? So everything here, eliminating the functions. So the reason you can't change it in Java is the same reason you can't change it in C++. So we'll go here. So this is stack. And this is heap or free store, right? Free store. The screen's moving. Let me have to hold it. OK, free store. And again, remember this guy sequential has a small footprint. It's small, 10, usually around 20, 10, 24 kilobytes. This one's uh, two to four gigabytes. It's random sequential. So you see no one's gonna miss that in the midterm, right? Okay, so we diagram str. And again, these numbers, I just make them up, right? I always start with 100 because they're easy to work with. And then this one's also a y100, meaning yx are some large number in memory. So then this one will be uh, 96. Uh, this one will be uh, 99 because we're dealing with one character. 98, 97, 96, 95, 94, right? Here it's 4 because we're dealing with integers, and integers represent uh memory slots. Okay, so okay, so where is hello? So assuming it starts here, so it'll be um, H E L L O and uh, what value goes in here? Well it's always the first uh, memory address of the initial uh, character in the sequence, right? So y98 so y98 and then we try and narrow okay so this piece is this right here okay what is happening when we say for out och in string in memory well uh, what color uh, we'll use blue when this statement executes right here, it goes there, and a copy of the first element is put right here. So then this is h. So if I say uh, ch equal t, which address am I changing? x 96 or y 98? I would think 96. 96. So, although in Java, I don't know, I'm not using Java, right? But in C++, it'll let you do this. But if you don't understand that this is happening, then, and you're like, oh, this is going to be some other value. Well, it won't because each iteration you're modifying a copy, right? So a copy is equal to a value, right? So notice here, I uh, let me go, where did I put that? I thought I wrote value somewhere, but I guess I forgot. Oh, right here, right? So that is a value variable or parameter, meaning a copy. I don't. I don't know. I don't know why they they should have named it copy, right? Because value is kind of like what. So okay, so we say C. So then this one becomes um, T, but the original one still H. So we're not modifying 
the original memory location. We're modifying a different memory location, this one over here. So on the second iteration, uh, we use the same block. So then this one will no longer be T, it'll be E, right? Because that's the second character. And if we try to change it, then we will be changing a copy. And that's why it seems we can't change it. We're changing a temporary variable. There is a way uh, to allow the changes. I won't cover it right now, but there, there is a way. This right here is very important because if you understand this concept, then on Thursday, when we talk about val value parameters and reference parameters or reference variables, then you'll understand why uh, sometimes you cannot change an incoming variable into a function and why sometimes you can change an incoming variable that comes into a function, right? So the one you cannot change is a copy or a value parameter and the one you can change is a reference parameter or variable. Questions here with this diagram, what's going on? Done here. And no. uh, we should be able to, to demonstrate this. Uh, go here, back to our code. And uh, CH, I don't know, I'll just put uh, Z, but let me put it after we display each character, right? So we don't, uh, okay. Okay, so C out. Okay, so we go here and run it. Okay, so notice here H E L L O, and in the code block for the for loop, we're explicitly changing the character to letter Z or T or whatever. And then line 40, we're like, okay, well, give me the value of the string that came in. And it gives me the value, and it's still hello. It didn't generate an error here. Like, it didn't tell me, like, you can't change it. Or it is changing something, and that something is in this diagram. And it's that character there that's a temporary copy for each loop. And that's... Okay, so that concept is also in Python, too. Uh, you like you can't iterate over the string. Well, we we iterate not iterate, over the but string. yeah, not iterate, but like rewrite the string with iteration. There we go. That's well. Here we can, but I'm just demonstrating that we can't first, right? And I'm also introducing this concept of a value or a copy, right? So this concept I'm introducing, and. Uh, let me think here. Uh, well, since I started this, right, and I think that's all I got as far as loops is concerned. Let me see here. We're ranging. Uh, yeah, so I might as well talk about this, right? So, okay. So, so that was the copy. And let me introduce the next concept, which is a reference, right? So we go here. And, uh, I'll start in main first, just to show you. Uh, okay, so okay, uh, and then.
Okay, so let's see what this output. Okay, so I make sure I have the correct syntax here. Okay, I'll run it. And uh, I'll put this here, right? So five and five. Okay, so we know we know what this is in variable. Uh, what is this, right? So this is an int reference variable. Okay, let me get this, bring it over here, and put it here. And this is this concept is very important for the way functions parameters work. Okay, so. Uh, if there's questions, now would be the time. So here we're simply working with stack. There's no string, so we're not working with heap. I will draw the heap, but it's not in play right now. And we're like, okay, so God, what? Is it six, uh, what time is it over here? 6.50 or 7? I forget. It's 6.52 right now. It's over at 6.50? It ends at 7. At 7? Okay. Okay, okay, yeah, because so, so, uh, so many classes, sorry. <laughs> Stack. Okay, so we're good with time. So then we have, uh, okay, so then we're like, okay, let's diagram like I've been showing you. So then we know that this one will be here. There's no heap. So in this case, we get the value, right? Five. So then five, obviously, and, and some computer number, right? So 196 and so forth. And then we're like, Okay, so what do I do with this one? Well, if we go back and look at the output of our program, let me clear this. Up arrow, enter. So notice it was five and five. So then a reference variable, maybe like a clone, right? So then we come back over here. And... Uh, Will it go here? No. Instead, what happens is this reference or ampersand, right? Let me see if I can draw it here. Uh, it means reference a variable's memory location okay so then the value of numref is what according to the definition five five oh, or, to or x100 that memory address wherever five yeah. is yeah x100 right so then this guy has x100 meaning like it's referencing or pointing to uh, x100 so then this one is also pointing to that memory location and if we go back to our program here and then we say okay so how about uh, num ref equals 10 actually down here right and let's see if uh, that's the case. We'll eventually create a test case for this, but uh, what I'd like to do is just show you in main, and then we'll go back and write test cases for this with functions. Okay, so what will the value of num and ref be here? Let's go back to the diagram. It's five. Right. So if I say num ref equals 10, what will num be? Num should still be five. And num ref? Num ref will be ten, but num should still be five. Okay, so let's go ahead and run it. So we have five and five, and then num is ten, and num ref is ten. Why? The answer is here. Because it's 
just change that reference to the memory location. I thought it was going to overwrite X100 and just make it 10. That's why I thought num was going to stay 5. Yeah, no, no. So the num ref has the address, right? So if we say num ref equals to 10, then what we're saying is whatever value is at X100, make it 10 now. So that's what we did. And you, to your point that it was going to change address, in references, once we assign it an address, we cannot change it. Like It'll always point to, X, to num, the num uh, variable's address. Always, we can't we can't change it to an, another address. C plus plus will generate an error. Let's see here. Uh, so, on uh, any questions here? Would it make sense? If, what is the difference between having num ref on the left and num on the right, and vice versa? So what's the difference with num ref and num here? Right here in this statement? Right. So if we reverse num equals num ref, what would this, that give us? Num equals num ref? Well, I mean, whatever value uh, num ref is will be in, uh, in num, but it's 10. Right, so okay. So here a copy is created. Or well, here I a copy is not created. They point to the memory location, meaning over here we're dealing with two different address locations, right? Y98 on the first iteration, uh, X96 uh, on the first iteration, the value is H, we change it to T, it'll change this one, this one's left unchanged. Uh, over here, both point to the same address, so that's why it should be understandable why if we say number equals 10, then the variable, the original variable changes to 10 and then num ref points to the original variable so it's 10. Right? So. Any other questions? And you thought we were going to be talking about loops, right? So that makes sense. Actually this concept uh, transfers to C-sharp, to Java, and to Python, right, when you work with classes. Uh, and uh, on Thursday, we'll start talking about functions, and we'll see how the, these uh, two uh, types of variables affect how functions uh, process variables, right? So there's no, there's no quiz today, no assignment. There'll be a quiz and an assignment on Thursday. So uh, I'm not sure, I guess, Usually everybody gets here on time, right? So uh, we'll still probably have the quiz at the beginning of the class, and then uh, the assignment should be an easy one toward the end of the class. And um, that's all I have for today. Thank you.